Today we have Paul here. He's a PhD student here at CMU. He's a second year. Uh, he's going to talk to us about fluid mechanics of liquid democracy. And uh, well, good luck. Yeah, thanks. Um, hi, everyone. I'm very glad that you made it here. Um, I would like to present some work that Anson, Simon, Ariel, who, who is in the audience, and I did on liquid democracy. So naturally, I will begin by explaining to you what liquid democracy exactly is. And in a nutshell, it's a fashionable way of taking decisions as a group. And I hope that throughout this talk, it will somehow transpire why we believe that this is a very exciting and very promising approach. All that said, there are issues. And especially the, there's this issue of super voters um, that I will explain next. And the rest of this talk will be, um, will be reserved for our remedy of the problem. We propose an extension of liquid democracy. And I will explain to you what that extension is and why we believe that it will be helpful. Before I start explaining liquid democracy, I would like to take a step back and speak about two other ways of taking decisions as a group that you might be more familiar with. So let's say we have to take a common decision as a group, yes or no, on something. And one very easy and maybe the, the first thing, uh, thing and maybe the first thing that comes to our mind is to set this up as a direct democracy. Every person receives one vote. We tally the votes, and whatever the majority says is what we as a society will do. So in this case, um, whatever yes stands for. And the system is very simple, but it has nice properties. For example, everyone clearly has the same say in, in the decision. It is very clear how whatever we as a society will end up doing is rooted in what a majority of the population wants. So there's a like, good foundation for the legitimacy of, of our decision. And, and all these are, are reasons why, why democracy has, has been around for so long and uh, is still the, the, the measure of choice. But there's one significant problem with it, which is the division of labor. We live in these very complicated societies. We have very complicated jobs here. And so do lawmakers. We don't have the time to every week read, uh, spend the entire week reading about tax law to, do one, uh, to, to, to vote on one thing and spend the next week reading up on environmental policy or something. So we want to be able to outsource some of that uh, learning, some of that deliberation process. And this is why direct democracy, at least for the bulk of decisions, has been replaced in all democracies that I'm aware of by another system, representative democracy. In representative democracy, hi, the, uh, this is Anson. Um, um, in representative democracy, we no longer only have this body of the population. In, uh, in addition to that, we have some of us who run for office. And every so often, for example, yesterday, we have a very intricate process in which we select some of these people running for office to go into the second body, Congress, if you want, of representatives. And in between, whenever we have a decision and we need to take a decision, only these people in Congress take the time to learn about the issue, take, uh, they vote, and the majority of the people in Congress get to decide what we do. The hope is that hopefully we've set up this first step in such a way that every member in Congress roughly represents the same share of the population, and so that a majority in Congress is still rooted in a majority or at least a large group of people in the population. But, well, that connection is strenuous. This system definitely allows for a division of labor. We can vote every two years if we, are, if we want to, maybe every four years, and in between get a lot of research done, so, so that's awesome. But there's a couple of problems. For example, even though the people is a sovereign of, of a democratic state, we only have a say every four years. And for example, let's say tomorrow something very unexpected comes up, Maybe we would select another representative than, we, the, than the one we chose yesterday. But still, this person would be there for years pretending to represent us and making this con uh, connection between a majority of, the, uh, of representatives to a ma majority of the population even more strenuous. Another problem is that we typically don't have all that much of a choice. We get to choose between a handful of representatives and many people feel that no single one of them really aligns with their values and interests, but that it's maybe in the worst case uh, an issue of selecting the least of evils. Finally, I think most importantly, there has been a, an, an, an erosion of trust in, in politicians. 
For example, according to this recent Gallup poll, only 11% of Americans trust Congress a great deal or quite a lot. If we think about Congress and Parliament as trustees of the people, that is a devastating result. So, 11% seems high, I'm surprised. <laughs> it's as high as it has been in years. So yes, yeah, yeah, your intuition is right. Um, so maybe what, what we would look for is something in pre between the, the two systems. It feels like in this system, it, like it is too rigid maybe. There's too much of a separation between these representatives and the population, whereas direct democracy was nice, but it's just way too demanding. And maybe there's something in between that we can do. The people trust themselves. <laughs> yes, for, for everything else, I think I'm, I'm the wrong person to ask. Maybe you need a psychoanalyst. <laughs> Uh, we, we have to operate on, on, on these conditions. So uh, liquid democracy promises to fill the space in between these two and hopefully uh, retain some of the positive aspects without inheriting too many of the bad aspects. We, we again begin just as in direct democracy. Every person always has the right, if they want to, to vote on everything on their own. But now let's say, for example, I've been busy preparing this talk, so I don't have the time to, to read about whatever is coming up. But fortunately, I have a friend. And we've discussed politics. I know that our interests, our values align. I trust this person's integrity. And as a result, I, I just have confidence that if they look at, at a question, they do their work, they think about it hard, whatever answer they will come up with, I, I will vouch for. I can live with that answer being my own. And this is why, for, for cases like mine, liquid democracy allows delegation. So I can just temporarily hand over my vote while I'm busy, while I feel that this other person is more qualified, to this other person, and the other person can then vote with double weight. The, the only missing, missing piece of this puzzle is that these delegations are also transitive. If I trust my friend to make the right decision, and this friend feels that the the best decision they can make is to delegate on her, uh, their, their vote, then, um, then I should also be okay with my vote being delegated onwards to this third person who will then vote with all of our voting weight. And of course this generalizes to these delegation networks, which are essentially a, co a collection of other senses. Um, we have delegators on the outside who are people who delegate, and we have some of these sinks, uh, preferably all of them, uh, who are voters and who vote with a weight proportional to the size of their connected components. Then when, when we ha have an issue, these voters can vote, we can tally the votes. And I would argue that this still retains quite a lot of the benefits of direct democracy. For example, everyone still has the same amount of power that they would have in direct democracy. They, if they feel strongly about an issue, they can vote for themselves. Um, if, we, uh, if we take a decision as a group, we still can find a connection to a majority of the population. Maybe not all of them have directly said, I want this, but all of them have either said this or transitively trust someone who has said this. We also do have a division of labor. Some of these systems even go so far in, uh, as to, to allow you to, do di uh, to uh, specify different delegates for different areas um, where, where you might delegate your vote in uh, matters of labor, labor law, to this one, one person who you know is very qualified, while retaining your, your vote for, for certain other areas and delegating to a third person in other areas. So this is a very, um, it, it, it's a very, very strong uh, form even of, of separation of labor. But we, we don't have, have the problems that I described with, uh, with, with representative democracies. We, we can at any point vote for ourselves. We can at any point switch our, switch our delegates if we feel that someone else will now represent us better. We don't just have a couple of people to choose from. We can choose from the entire population or just vote for, uh, for uh, ourselves for all, uh, all issues that come up. But finally, the, the issue of trust, I think, is, is very nicely managed in liquid democracy because this primitive of delegation is just a primitive of personal trust. And from me to the person who will vote in my name, there is this chain of, of intimate personal trust relationships. Uh, ju just as an example, if, if I watch whatever my transitive delegate does, maybe many steps uh, along this chain, and I see that this person does something that I heavily disagree with, 
then I can just ask my direct delegate. And I can ask him, what do you think of that thing? And there's, there's two options. Either my, my, uh, the, the person I trusted says, no, I'm totally fine with it, aren't you? In this case, maybe, maybe I, uh, I shouldn't have trusted them so much. So I'll change my delegation. And OK, well, uh, I'll, I, I've paid my price. But from then on, I'll, I'll probably p pick a better delegate. The other option is that my delegate also is appalled by, by, uh, by what happened. And so they can go on in this chain. And hopefully, on some, p uh, at some link between me and my transitive delegate, someone will decide that they made a mistake will change the delegation, and this, in, in this way the system can self-heal and provide for a very strong level of, um, uh, of accountability. And yeah, I, I th for, for me this is uh, a good basis for, for trusting the decisions that ca come out of su such a system. As hopefully you, you can hear, I'm excited about this approach. And, hope, uh, and uh, very fortunately so are other people. I've selected three here. The biggest and most important uh, uh, real-world trial with liquid de democracy has happened in the Pirate Party in Germany. The system was called Liquid Feedback, and at the highest point, they had 10,000 active party members inside of their party uh, using that for, for internal decision-making. Uh, since then, there, there have been uh, other attempts. So for example, Democracy OS and Flux in Argentina and Australia, both of them were parties who ran for national elections on the promise that if they would gain any seats in parliament, the, uh, these representatives would vote bindingly according to decisions made uh, inside of the party through a liquid democracy system. So this is even a much stronger commitment to liquid democracy. Unfortunately, I said would have because neither of them actually won any votes in parliament, but we believe that this shows that, that there's continued interest and we, we very much hope that liquid democracy will only play a big role. Yes? Was it well defined what in the party means? Well, I, I assume party members. Um, I, I'm still not really sure how it works here in the US. I, I have the feel, I'm not sure whether you can actually be a part of the, uh, of the party or whether you just register, uh, re register as, as, as a party affiliate or something. Uh, for example, back, uh, back home in Germany, I'm, I'm part of a party where, where and, and this is a relatively small fraction of the population, you pay some membership dues. And this, this is well defined, I think. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, so, yeah, we, we believe that liquid democracy continues to, to play a role and will continue to play a role. But, in these, but, but, but this, these trials in the real world also exposed some weaknesses of the liquid democracy approach. And in particular, in the Pirate Party, where they had this significant number of people participating, they realized that there was a small number of delegates who had a lot of this transitive voting weight, where, where most people didn't. And people felt very strongly that this was a problem. So, for example, um, there, there's this Spiegel article where they describe the case of this one Pirate Party member, Martin Hase, whose uh, vote was like a decree. I don't fully buy that, but that shows how uncomfortable people were with the uh, thought that one single person could represent hundred, uh, hundreds or at least more than, than 100 people. I don't know the, the exact number. And there's also uh, an analysis of the liquid, uh, uh, liquid feedback data set that I would like to point, uh, point at. They looked at super voters, and they say that uh, in the distribution of voting weights, the power law exponent is 1.38, whatever that might mean. I uh, don't have a good intuition for that, except that it means that some people have a lot of voting weight, some don't. Um, that indicates that most voters have no delegations, and a small set of voters possess a huge voting weight, who are called the super voters. And they go on to say that in a discussion on the effect of super voters, the democratic nature of the system was questioned and many users became inactive. And I think that shows that there's real concern uh, behind that. So what was the mechanism for changing who you're, who you're giving your voting power to? Like, is there a web? You go on a, like, what's the time scale? Can you decide, I don't want to give my vote to this guy anymore, I want to give yeah, yeah they, they, they had a web platform, um, so li Liquid Feedback is not formally tied to, to, to a pirate party. You can install that on your server and you have the, these web interfaces where over the course of months you can switch back and forth, you can delegate uh, per area, you can dele delegate globally, you can override that in, in certain decisions. Is it, I, mean, I think it's a very, very good and very flexible system. Yeah, Gregory? Yeah, out of curiosity, um, how does the privacy of this allocation work? 
to whom is the information like available, like who I, for instance, allocate my vote to? That's a very good point. Um, in, the, uh, in the Pirate Party, everything was public to all party members. And there are some good reasons to, to want to do that. Um, one good reason is that, that you really want to prevent cycles from forming. And um, that's no problem as soon as people see how delegations form in real time and see whether they would contribute to a cycle. But it is a problem if you don't want to tell them that information and, and uh, when, when they would be private. Yeah. So they, they have everything being, being public. There are more recent proposals trying to, to build these uh, things in a <coughs> private way. I'm not convinced of them because I think they hide too much information from people. I guess my concern is that we have a, we have a private ballot, a secret ballot, so yeah. you can't effectively sell your vote. But yeah. if, if uh, like allocation information is public, you can sell your allocation. <sighs> I'm pretty sure that I could sell my vote here if I want. Well, I, fortunately, I don't have a vote in this country. Um, with, with the help of a, of a phone in the voting booth or, um, or at least with voting records um, that at least make it public whether I voted or not, I think that buying votes is, a, uh, is an actual concern, um, not just in, in, in these new systems, but in general. Um, hopefully, most people won't do that, but it's, it's definitely something... Um, that, that has to be thought of, and also is something that, that I have, have been thinking about. Um, I don't think there's a good solution to that yet. Yeah. If you have more than one vote, can you separate it? Um, you, you can't in liquid democracy. That, that's actually uh, well, um, going very much in the direction that I will go, go later. In liquid democracy, usually, uh, like the, you, you only have one single, single delegate. And there's a good reason to, to want to do that, namely this, this argument of, of this chain of trust. It's very difficult if, if my vote gets, um, just like flows into, into this big branching tree and, and ends up with 1,000 different people, it's very difficult for me to still know what my vote does and whether my vote is maybe being misused. So I think that, that there's a strong argument to be made that you actually want one delegate and so one transitive delegate. Um, yeah. Um, so pe people definitely have the perception that super voters are bad. There are more tangible, um, tangible reasons why you might not want super voters. For example, they're more exposed to corruption, obviously, if, if they have more, more power. Um, another thing that, that I would, would be afraid of is that having these super voters might mess up the political debate. And let's imagine that we're in a scenario where super voters control a majority of the, of the vote, and then we have lots of people like, like you and I, we have our own vote, maybe our moms, and then um, the, 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 the super voters are probably the kind of people who also have law projects that they would like to, to have passed. And then they might face a decision to either sit down with each of us for half an hour and win one measly vote for the majority, or to meet with other super voters behind closed doors, People vote for things they don't fully agree with in exchange for votes on, on their own project, and then they you know, like, give us some, some terribly long bill uh, deciding 100 uh, things that nobody is actually very happy with. And that would be, would be a very bad outcome, and that would be an outcome that I think becomes much more uh, likely as soon as we have these ine strong inequalities in, in voting weights between people. Um, and one, one final thing that I would like to, to point at is this paper by the three other authors of this paper um, that, that were, was written before I joined the group. In this paper, they look at liquid democracy in a very specific setting. They assume that there's one decision that is good for society and one that is less good. And model agents as, as just through, through a parameter which is called their competency, a probability essentially of a biased coin of voting for the right decision if, if they vote for themselves. And in, in, in such a setting, it, it is somewhat natural to, to assume that delegating to people who are more competent, if, if we always delegate from, from less competent people to more competent people, that this is a good thing for society and will, will make it more likely that society uh, will, will make good decisions. But this is not the case. Here's a simple example where we have these um, barely qualified uh, red voters on the outside and this uh, somewhat more qualified 80% a voter in the, in the middle, if everyone would just vote for themselves, we can profit from something that is known in the community as the Condorcet voter the uh, jury theorem, I'm sorry, uh, which says that the more of these barely competent people we add, the more likely it becomes that the majority of them will get it right. Whereas if everyone were to delegate to this one person, we would move all these votes to more competent people, sure, 
But we would concentrate the vote so much that if this one person messes it up, which can still happen with 80 percent, uh, with 20 percent probability, then society as a whole will, will make the mistake. So this is one more reason why too much concentration of power is a bad thing. I think that these arguments, they, they come from very different directions. But I think that they all point in one common direction, namely that we need to somehow get the, the, the weight of, the, of, of these super voters down. And how, how could we do that? How could, can we impose a we, we could impose a limit on, on that, how, how much voting weight people have. We could say, if you ask and want to delegate to this person, and tra uh, tr transitively your vote will, would go to this one person who already has too much voting weight. So we'll just tell you, don't do that. Um, vote for yourself or choose someone else. We could do that, but the, um, the creators of this liquid feedback system, I think, make a very cogent case for why we, don't want, why we never want to restrict delegation. And in fact, delegation can always be done outside of the system. The um, U.S.N. could just call your transitive delegate at the night uh, before, before the poll closes and ask for, for what to vote for. Or in an online setting, which is a very likely uh, implementation of liquid democracy, you might just hand over your credentials to, to your transitive delegate. In this case, we still have super voters. We just don't know who they are. And that's arguably worse. So our approach will try the, the other direction. We, we will try not to take away any freedom of expression from, from our agents. We instead, we'll ask agents to give us some, some degrees of freedom. And um, hopefully, in a way that these agents don't, uh, don't suffer from giving us the, these degrees of freedom, but that we, we're still able to, to improve the problem of super voters. I would like to get back to my own situation. I said I had this friend who, who I trusted and who, who I would feel comfortable delegating to. And I somehow s somewhat simplified when I said this because I'm very glad to have multiple such people in my life. I, I wouldn't be able to tell you that I trust this person more than this person, more than this person. I trust them for different reasons. But I trust them to make good decisions and I would vouch for them. And in a classical liquid democracy setting, I would be in the awkward position of choosing probably arbitrarily between them. The idea is maybe if, if many people feel that way, that they have multiple people who they uh, would consider delegating to, maybe they can just directly tell this to us, give us multiple options. We can then have a, a centralized mechanism who will choose one delegate for each of them which gives us just a classical liquid democracy uh, graph that people can vote on, that we can calculate weights on. But of course, the, uh, our mechanism would use these degrees of freedom for social good. And in this case, this means for getting down the weight of the heaviest super voter. This can, of course, be uh, formulated as a, as a problem of, uh, on graphs, where we have these graphs and we have certain labeled uh, sinks in the graph. We want to, to throw out edges such that our graph will be acyclic and uh, have at, at most our, our degree one for, for every agent. And we want to do that, you, you, one, one way of formulating it, is we want to do that in such a way that the size of the heaviest, uh, of the largest connected component is, uh, is minimal. And we also want to have some, some conditions that we don't throw unnecessary, unnecessary edges out because otherwise it's, it's too easy. Um, yeah, but, but, but it, it, it can be form formulated in, in the languages of graphs very, very naturally. One thing to notice is that this, this problem can be expressed directly as an integer linear program, which means that for typical input sizes and for typical input structures as well, we, uh, we're probably just able to solve it optimally. Now, we might be concerned with large input sizes, maybe, weirdly, maybe weird inputs. It would be terribly embarrassing to, to have this election, have people give us uh, their, their delegations, and then have to, to say, oh, actually, we're not able to do that because you happen to, uh, to have hit a bad case. Uh, so, we, we so, because, yes. Sorry. What's the incentive for people to declare their preferences truthfully? Uh, because we, presumably, because if you change preferences, you might influence how other people's delegations work out, and therefore you gain. Something. Yeah, yeah. Um, manipulation is definitely a problem, and manipulation is a problem in nearly all um, settings of voting. Um, it, it, it doesn't directly uh, apply, but in, in 
like most settings of, of voting in, in general, there, there are variations of the Gibbard set of weight theorem, which say that, that there you can profit from, from misrepresenting your, your preferences. This doesn't directly fit, fit on, the, on this model, but I think in general, for elections, we have the problem that we cannot, simply, simply can, cannot both have strategy proofness. The basic and, yeah. fluid in democracy which seems not to have had that problem. And now it might have had this problem. So you're, are you introducing a new problem? We, well, to a certain degree, yes. Because the way I presented liquid democracy was for, um, was for settings where there's only two, uh, only binary outcome that can happen. Uh, which in, in general needn't be true. For example, in the Pirate Party, it was not true for, for many things they, that they did. Um, and then, for, for example, it's, it's also not, not really defined because usually these, uh, these delegations are public and are coming in one after another. That might also lead to weird behavior, but I wouldn't even know. Well, no. It, 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 I, th I think the more basic problem is that I wouldn't even know how to formalize people's utilities if they don't have a, have a clear opinion on, on the question. I mean, this is why they, why they need to delegate, because they don't know whether to vote yes or no. The eventual delegate has more power. If my yes. convention counts for X, and X has yes. more power, then my utility is greater. Yeah. And, it's uh, easy to quantify. Yeah. And, 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 and in this dimension, um, we, we, we're adding a new, uh, a new vector for, for manipulation. You're right. Um, so if, if we are concerned about integer linear programs not, not cutting it, um, we might consider approximation algorithms, uh, where unfortunately uh, it is NP hard to approximate uh, this problem up to uh, within a logarithmic factor, but at least we do have an approximation algorithm that grants us a slightly worse logarithmic factor. Both of these results follow from a reduction to confluence flows. Um, and we're building up on this work by Chen et al. And we'd just like to, to speak about the reduction for a moment. So what was the objective again? Minimize the weight of the maximum, or the maximum weight supervoter? Um, sorry, I didn't catch what the... What was yeah. the objective? Yes, yes. That, that, that is the objective that, um, that, that we selected. Yeah. Um, so j just to, to sketch the, the reduction, we, we could think of voting power as being this mysterious liquid. And because every agent has an inherent voting power of one, we think of one unit of voting power liquid drizzling into every node. The only people who can actually make something of this voting power liquid are the voters who can transform this voting power liquid in, into actual influence on, on outcomes. And for everyone else, we somehow need to decide how to route out the incoming voting power liquid among their outgoing delegations. Now, uh, as, as Ivan mentioned, in, in liquid democracy, we ca cannot split up um, delegations. We, we have one single delegate, so we're in the more constrained setting of confluent flow, where we can only route out things through one single outgoing edge at, at most. Um, and, and as soon as we formulated it in, in this way, uh, essentially, what, what we're trying to do boils down to minimizing congestion um, on, uh, on, on this flow graph for confluent flow, which has been studied by Chen et al. There are some complications, mostly what to do with uh, agents whose vote cannot possibly reach any voter, and this is what complicates the reduction a bit, but in th this is the, the interesting part of it. Now, I have explained to you what, what our extension is. What we propose, um, why we believe, and, and our simulations also show that, that we can solve, uh, that, that, that we can resolve these potential delegations in reasonable time for, for reasonable input sizes. The big question is, why should this help? And we, we can't make such an argument in, in general. So, if, for example, let's say we have a setting of classical liquid democracy, everyone has one delegate, and we have a problem with super voters. We ask very nicely, uh, we uh, plead very, very nicely. And, and finally, we convince everyone to give us a second option. If everyone chooses the same second option, then we can route a tiny little bit of voting power liquid their way before they become too, too strong. And then we essentially stuck with whatever we had before. So the, the argument must somehow rest on the structure that we assume for, for these delegation graphs. And, um, and the fact that we, we believe that a setting like the one I, I just described is very unlikely to happen. 
preferably we would just resolve that question by, by having good data. But first of all, we're the first ones to, to propose this extension of liquid democracy. So nobody has tried that with multiple delegations in practice. And even for classical liquid democracy, where, where we could imagine enhancing these data sets, unfortunately, the data set by the Pirate Party, which is by far the most interesting, um, is no longer accessible to, to scientific research. So what we do is a second best thing. We build a stochastic model for, for how these delegation networks come into being and then show things relative to, to, to this model. A model which is inspired by preferential attachment has these three parameters. Um, D, a probability of delegation. K, a number of, uh, of delegations per delegator. And gamma, which will influence the shape of the, of the delegation network. I'll speak about all of them as they come up. As in normal preferential attachment, we add one agent at a time and directly make their delegation decisions. The first one clearly has to be a voter because there's no one who, who they could delegate to. And then whenever we introduce a new node, let's say node T, we first flip a biased coin. With probability D, the, the, the agent will delegate. With probability 1 minus D, as the one I've shown here, um, the, the, voter instead, the, the agent instead becomes a voter. If the agent becomes a delegate, we need to somehow choose the k-many outgoing uh, delegation options. And we, we do all of them independently, which technically adds the possibility for them to, to point to the same person. This is, uh, everything else would make the math very, very, very ugly. Um, and, and also, it only strengthens our, our point, because it just means that when we assume that people give us many delegations, some of them will, will give us a sm smaller delegation, just as a, as a technical aside. The main question is how to choose the, uh, the agent uh, among the previous agents that we delegate to. One very, very, very easy answer would be to choose one uniformly at random, which we call uniform delegation. And that's probably a good uninformed, uh, uninformed choice. Another option would be preferential attachment, where we say that we attach to every year previous agents with probability proportional to the in degree plus one to also make it possible to, to delegate to agents who don't receive any, uh, any delegation so far. And the rationale for that would be that the in degree is probably a proxy for how well connected this person is socially and how compatible their views are with other people. And so someone who already receives a high uh, number of, of incoming delegations probably is more likely to receive more incoming delegations in the future. And this is exactly preferential attachment, where it has been found to mirror, um, for example, characteristics like the, the distribution of degrees in a graph of, of the ones known from social networks, such as academic citation graphs. I personally believe that probably the truth is somewhere in between. Uh, since I assume that these delegations are made based on, on personal trust relationships, I would be surprised to find people who actually receive, let's say, more than 50 uh, of, of these delegations, not, not, not transitively, but, 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 but directly. Um, the, I mean, yeah. if you're single, you get yeah. millions. Yeah, Beyonce is going to get a lot. <laughs> yes. The, 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 I, I, I definitely wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't directly, directly delegate to, to someone who, um, who, I, who I don't, don't personally know. If people behave that way, um, probably that, that, that is a better choice. Yes? I mean, you had this one example of the yeah. super delegate earlier. Like, yeah. people looked at the process and it just sort of abnormally happened naturally, or was this person out campaigning to say, please give me um, your yeah. trust? Yeah, I, I don't think they were very actively uh, campaigning. They were a linguistics professor uh, somewhere in northern Germany. I, I forgot the, the city. And they, um, this, is, this, this person has a podcast, which is somewhat well-known. He's, he's well-connected in the scene. And simply seems to, seems to be knowledgeable. I don't think he ever campaigned for it. And also, why the Spiegel article says that his vote was like a decree, it was, like, it, it was never like he controlled, let's say, I, yeah, I, unfortunately, I, th these numbers are very hard to come by. But my, my uh, guess would be that he probably controlled 1% to 2% of the vote at the time. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, uh, may, may, maybe we, maybe Beyonce uh, will be there. Then we sh should choose that. Uh, maybe we, sh we should choose something slightly less drastic, just to cover our bases. Um, we introduce this parameter gamma, um, th this exponent here that allows us to interpolate between the setting of uniform delegation if we set gamma to zero, and full-blown Beyonce-style uh, preferential attachment if we set gamma to one, and everything in between. To, to see what this parameter gamma does to, uh, to, to, prefer, uh, to, to our graph model on the same parameters here, uh, we can look at the, these example graphs that I generated. On the top, this, this is a very loose network. It might describe things that are, you know, where, where people actually delegate to friends, at least from, from first glance. Um, this here is definitely Beyonce, um, re receiving a ton of incoming delegations. Um, my, my, my personal prior would be that we have something like here where, where we definitely have people who receive a, con a concentration of, of direct delegations, um, but where, where it's not as drastic. But yeah, I, I, I don't know the, the way to go would be to, to verify this uh, with empirical data as soon as, as it becomes available. Uh, I would also like to point out that we, that we don't need to go to high gammas to have super voters. So, um, okay, no, that thing still doesn't work. Um, for example, if you look at this voter, voter up here, um, he, uh, while he doesn't receive many direct, um, direct delegations, he has this guy up uh, uh, just north of him who receives quite a lot of them, and, and there's a lot of people who transitively delegate to him. Maybe we can route that away, but, um, but people don't need to get a high number of direct incoming delegations to become super voters. And um, this is, in effect, something that we uh, that will show later, that even for this case of gamma equals zero, if you only have one outgoing delegation per agent, we will see super voters. Yeah. So our, um, our, our technical uh, approach is to, to show that going from one outgoing delegation to multiple, say two, will lead to, to a big difference in the, in the maximum weight of any voter. This has two parts. We need a lower bound on, uh, on the maximum, maximum weight for one, de uh, one delegation per, per delegator, and we need an upper bound for two delegations. Both of these bounds will only, unfortunately, apply to the gamma equals zero case, mostly for questions of tractability. The math is plenty ugly already. Um, and, and, and this is a problem, but the, the idea is we, we will show for, for the gamma equals zero case that there's a doubly exponential uh, separation between the cases of k equals one and k equals two. And that gives us some, some hope that, that, the, um, that, that the separation will also survive increasing gamma. And we will then show that, that empirically this is indeed the fact, in, in, indeed the case. So I would like to start with the uh, k equals one low, lower bound. And Technically, for the separation, we need a bound holding with high probability. Uh, this is on the expectation, just because it's way neater, um, and and it works out very uh, in a very straightforward way. Just just the maximum amount of math I want to put on slides. Um, so let, let's look at this. We we have this uh, this process uh, with uniform delegation and one outgoing delegation per per uh, delegator. We define a random variable as i which is the weight of the first voter, which is a lower bound on the weight of the heaviest voter, after inserting I agents. And we can build a recurrence for that, especially for, well, a recurrence for the expectation. After time step one, we just have this one voter, so the weight of voter one will be one. And in every subsequent step, we have the, um, the weight that we had before, and potentially add one more. When do we add one more? When the newly inserted agent will delegate, probability D, and then we'll choose something that transitively delegates to, uh, to voter one, which is this term, because ST is also the, pro the number of people who transitively delegate to voter one, and T is the total number of, of people who, who are there to choose from. So this recurrence, um, and yeah, uh, we profit a lot from, from linearity of expectation, uh, allows us to, to write this, um, this very clear recurrence, which fortunately, fortunately, actually has a close form solution. And um, you, you will have to believe me that it satisfies the first condition, but I, I just really like how, how this factor of one plus D over T 
goes into the t plus d and the t down here and gives us the same term for, for one larger t. <coughs> so since we have this, uh, this closed form solution, we can apply uh, an inequality due to Walter Gauchi to very, clear, uh, very easily get this lower bound that is a, a power function in T on the, the expected maximum weight. Or, well, for, first of all, the, the expected weight of voter one, so a lower bound on the expected maximum weight of any, uh, of any voter. And this is the first theorem. For the, uh, for, for the upper bound for the two delegation case, I don't have any chance of, of, uh, of showing you the proof like that. I would just like to, to sketch some, some, some ideas. When uh, early problem that we, uh, that we, or when early question that we have to resolve is how we want to reason about this at all. Because we don't just want to uh, argue about the graph now, but we want to argue about a resolution of the, of the edges on the graph. And if we would argue about the optimal resolution, we would have to argue about this uh, NP algorithm somewhere in there. And that sounds very, very difficult to do that alongside the creation of the graph. So what we instead do is that in, because we only want an upper bound, we, we don't look at uh, optimal resolution of these edges, but we look at a greedy resolution of these edges. We, whenever we insert a delegator, we di directly choose which of these, action, uh, which of these um, uh, delegation options to realize. And that, for example, allows us to compute the voting weights as we create this graph. Also note, please, that, um, that this approach only works as well because we have gamma equals zero. Because if, if, if gamma was, was higher than zero, then we could, couldn't just throw out the edges that we, that we uh, choose not to use. Because they, even though we wouldn't choose them for delegation, they would still bias uh, the, the choice of future, um, of, of, of future incoming, uh, incoming delegations. So this, this is the main part where our, our proofs rely on gamma equals zero. Um, and then the greedy algorithm always looks at the, at the uh, um, delegation options, looks at the uh, voters that we would transitively delegate to, and delegates to the one who currently has lower weight, which is very, very close to, to what you can observe in many load balancing settings as the power of two choices, uh, where, for example, in a balls and bin model, bin, well, <coughs> balls and bins model, uh, if you go from uh, throwing your balls into uniformly chosen bins to throwing your ball into the less full one out of two uniformly independently chosen bins, you have an exponential um, separation between the, uh, the maximum load of any bin. So we, we see a very similar uh, thing here, just complicated by the fact that we, we have this graph. And technically, um, there's a lot of um, similarity to something that Malishkin and Paquette looked at in a different setting where they're interested in the distribution of degrees in, um, in preferential attachment graphs with the power of choice. We don't actually have preferential attachment, but technically these problems uh, turned out uh, similar enough to, to build up on their proof. And this finally gives us this, this theorem over here, which says that with high probability, the maximum weight after inserting T voters is at most this doubly logarithmic bound. We ha now have a doubly exponential separation between the two. We would like to see, first of all, that these things are not just asymptotic, but also um, are, are visible for, for smaller input sizes. And we also would like to see whether indeed um, our separation survives increasing gamma. But, but this is still, excuse me. Yeah. But also it means in practical sense that if you actually run it in the world, it's argument in practical like speculation in the United States, nobody will get more than 10 votes. That separ you know, it seems like it defeats the whole separation of work uh, premise. Log log of uh, 100 million is small. Yes. And, and the, um, th th this is definitely one, one of the things where, where gamma equals zero is, 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 is unrealistic. The strong, strong assumption, and uh, yeah, the, the, the well, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll show you the, the, the graphs in, in a moment. But, but I agree that, that this is a good point. This this model definitely with gamma equals zero, and maybe even even in general is um, is is to um, is nice to us, which allowed us to to, to prove the separation. 
So at least in this nice case, um, we'll, we'll go to the more scary, scary one in a bit. Um, we, we definitely see that there's a, there's, there's a big separation. On the horizontal axis, we insert more and more agents. On the vertical axis, we have the maximum, vote of any, uh, maximum weight of any voter averaged over, uh, over many executions. And the gray line uh, shows the, the case for k equals 1, whereas the blue one shows us the, the case for k equals 2 with optimal resolution. And this yellow line that you might see in between uh, directly applies the greedy heuristic that we used for the proof. And we see that there's a, uh, unrealistically maybe um, separation between, between the two cases. We also see that the yellow and the blue line are very close together which means that a lot of the separation can indeed be, be explained by the power of choice. Now, if we, uh, if we increase gamma to 1, the separation is still pronounced, not as, um, but, but, but not as pronounced as, as in, in this very easy case, especially if we have a very high probability of delegation, um, these two, two graphs become closer together, but I think they're, they're still um, Quite, quite wide a gap that might, um, may, hopefully makes it worth also using that in practice. And I would also assume that, that going from, from this model of gamma equals one to actual messy practice would uh, further, further decrease the, uh, the separation. But the hope is that the separation still exists. And I, I believe that this, um, I, I find it very plausible that this phenomenon uh, of, of the power of choice uh, can, can be observable and can, can be useful in, in practice but I, I cannot prove it until, until we have data. Another thing that I would show be, before I conclude this talk is um, I, I would like to address the point that so far we, we compare two settings, one of classical liquid democracy and one where everyone gives us two delegation options. Now, if people give us more delegation options, that should only benefit us. That's without loss of generality, but it's not clear at all that we actually can convince everyone to, to give us two delegation options. And so in, in this next graph, we interpolate between, uh, between the setting of where, where everyone gives us one delegation option to the one where everyone gives us uh, two delegation options by just having a certain constant fraction of people give us two, two delegation options. And we see that, again, the margins decrease, but we, uh, we also see that the margins decrease gracefully. Uh, for example, if we can convince 40% to, uh, to give us two delegation options, by the way, this graph is, in, again, in the gamma equals one case, which is um, um, less, uh, less good for us that, for example, for 5,000, we still have a reduction in, uh, by, by one half in, in the maximum uh, voting weight. Okay, what, what would I like you to, to take home from this talk? Two things. First of all, I hope that, um, th th that you believe me that liquid democracy is a fascinating thing to study, but also, a fascinating way of actually making the, uh, taking decisions as a group. And while I also hope that, that it came across that, um, that, that super voters can be a problem, I hope that I made it uh, plausible that by giving people the option to give multiple delegations, we can ameliorate this problem. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to more questions. Yeah. Would it help you at all if you could allow, like, say, I give two thirds of my vote to this guy yeah. and one third to this guy, so you could like have a fractional? Yeah. Um, so it would mostly help us in algorithmic setting uh, sense because then we go from integer linear programs to linear programs. So our, our algorithmic problems would go away. Um, in in terms of further reducing the um, the voting weight, first of all, I think that that we already reduce uh, the voting weight quite a lot. The, the further benefits from, from allowing splitting votes didn't seem to see, did, seem hard, hardly visible at all. Um, and, and I don't think that this would, would counterbalance the, the cost that we pay in having less, less accountability. Is it like counterbalance if you could split votes? Is, can you like do it by network flow or something like this? Or do you have to do it with the um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Um, yeah.
Let's thank the speaker again then.